is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be looking at earthquakes! Earthquakes! Huh. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something. <laughs> That was supposed to happen earlier. Today we're going to be looking at how to build something that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. Mm -hmm. Earthquakes happen when two plates on the Earth's surface rub together, and it causes the ground to shake. It causes the ground to shake. Sometimes it shakes a little, sometimes it shakes a lot. Chances are you do not live in a place that has earthquakes. But if you do, ask an adult what to do during an earthquake so you can be safe. Modern buildings that are built in earthquake zones are designed to withstand the shaking. But how do scientists and engineers build a building that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at today. First thing we have to do is simulate an earthquake. We're going to build a shaker table. And here's what you need. Two books and... <sighs> Two books, four elastic bands, and four... four rubber balls. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. <laughs> four, four rubber balls. All right, so the first thing you do is actually take your four elastic bands and wrap them around your books. Put one set on one side, one set on the other side, until you have that. Then you take your four balls and you stick them in between the books in the middle-ish area. But you don't want to have them too close to the edges. And now two at the back. And ta-da, you've made your own shaker table. What are you shaking, you ask? I will show you. You build a tower. Like this one here that I built out of building blocks. So here's what you do. You'll need your base to be securely attached to the shaker table. I use painter's tape because it'll come off again without harming the books. And what I want to find out is just how much shaking this tower can take before it falls apart. Ready? Whoa. And there it goes. And when you've done that, what you do is you be a science maximite and you design another tower. And you tape it down to your shaker table and see if you can make this tower fall down in an earthquake. And if you built it really well, probably won't. <laughs> but you don't have to just use building blocks. There's all kinds of other materials you can use. Check out this building, which is really tall. And you'll see there's a cup at the top, and that's for a baseball. Put it up at the top, and that means there's a weight up there. And then we shake it, and we see what happens. Oh, oh no! Oh, there it goes. Having a big weight on the top of our tower means we need something that will resist the movement of that weight. So now we're going to start with a triangle. Unlike a rectangle, triangles are very stable. A wider base keeps the structure from swaying too much. And cross braces in the middle mean that there are other triangles within our triangle. All the better to resist movement. Thank you. After Anne and I built our tower, we added the weight to the top, secured it to the base, and tried it out. OK, here we go. Ooh. Looking good. No problem. It's not twisting. It's not, not even leaning. Not even creaking. No, it looks really good. Wow, this one is really solid. As you can see, this tower is way more solid than our square tower or the flexible tower. OK, look at that. Like, if that's not an earthquake, I don't know what is. Look at that. Look at the way the ground is moving. I don't know if we can shake it much more than this. Faster. Our triangular tower is up past a level of shaking that made the other towers collapse. Now it's time to max out the shaking. There's only one level of shaking that we can do above this. What's that? We shake from either side. We give it all we have. The floor was bouncing from side to side, the tower was tilting and was totally solid. It's still holding strong. 
In fact, Anne and I wore out before the building showed any signs of falling over. I think we've done it. Woo! Nice yeah. job. Yeah. Nice. Science Max experiments at large earthquake proof building. I mean, come on. That was impressive. I like it. Friends coming over and I don't have a table. But that's okay. I will make a table using my friends. This is an awesome experiment you can do with four friends. Come on in, science friends. I've got Sam and Dylan and Polly here to help me. So everybody turn to your left and sit sideways on the chair and then scooch the chairs into the middle. And then everybody leans back onto the knees of the other person. And then this is why I said you need four friends because you need the fifth person to remove the chairs. Whoa. The reason why this works is because everybody's weight is being supported on the legs of the person next to them. Okay, we're gonna rotate in a circle, everybody. Okay, ready? Here we go, rotating, R rotating. Oh, oh, science table. Ooh, hey, we're pretty good at this. Okay, uh oh, oh, oh no, oh no. <laughs> so there you go. Awesome way to make a table using your friends. Well done, well done, science. Another thing that happens during an earthquake is soil liquefaction. Liquefaction means something turns to liquid. In this case, the very ground you might be standing on. Here's how you can experiment with soil liquefaction. All you need is a plastic container and some water, not very much, barely enough to cover the bottom of the container because what you're gonna put in next is sand. And you wanna put it in there and spread it around. Just add enough sand so it just starts to turn dry on the very last layer. So here is a house that I'm gonna put on top. And now I will simulate an earthquake. The water rises up and it sort of turns to liquid. Soil liquefaction. And heavy things like houses and cars, they tend to sink like that. And then the soil rehardens and everybody's houses are stuck in the mud. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Bika, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. My tuna fish and meatball sub soup is coming along quite nicely. But what will we have for dessert? I know. How about earthquake buildings? Ha <laughs> ha! It's a building made out of wafer cookies. But the people on Vanilla Street built in the gelatin neighborhood. And the people on Chocolate Street built in the crispy rice part of town. Exciting. Now, here comes the earthquake. Oh no! Oh, it's shaking! Oh! The shaking has come and gone for the people on Chocolate Avenue, and their building is still standing. Now, let's take a look over here on Vanilla Street, and here comes an earthquake. Oh no! Oh dear! Looks like the people on Vanilla Street are going to have to rebuild their building because it's all fallen over and being eaten. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. Buildings can be built the same way, but the kind of soil they sit on make a large difference if there's an earthquake. Shaky, wiggly soil or solid, non-moving soil. So there you go, an experiment you can try at home. Delicious. Well, I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Cooking with Science. Mm, now to try my soup. Size barometer in 60 seconds. Learning how to predict and measure earthquakes is an important branch of science. The Earth is shaking, but which way did the earthquake come from? It's all about measuring the vibrations, and to do that, you need a seismometer. All you need is a ball, some paper cups, some modeling clay, a pencil, and science tape, which is the same thing as invisible tape, except I use this tape for science. First, take your pencil and stick it straight down into the modeling clay. Then, you take your cups and you arrange them in a circle and tape the cups down. And that goes right in the middle, just like that. Now what you do is you take the ball and you carefully balance it 
on the pencil. Now you have created a seismometer. It will tell you what direction an earthquake came from. Watch, I will be the earthquake, ready? Did you see that? The ball fell into the cup facing the direction that I hit the table. And now I'm gonna hit the table from over here. Yep, it fell in the direction that I hit the table. Okay, let's try from over here. There you go, your very own seismometer that you can use to measure earthquakes that you create on the table. You may recognize this. It is a spring. Yes, good for you. But did you know that springs can defy gravity? Whoa. Gravity de defy. Gravity defy. Gravity de Look at it fly. Defying. OK, not exactly. But what if I was to hold the spring like this and let it go? What'll happen? It'll fall. Yes, it'll fall. That's, that is true. But while it's falling, what happens to this end? Does it stay in one place? Does it go up or does it go down? Let's find out. I'll bring this in so you can really see it. OK, ready? Watch close. Did you see? Did you No? OK, tell you what. We'll watch it again, this time in slow motion. See? The bottom doesn't move, and here's why. When the top of the spring is released, gravity and the tension of the spring are pulling on it. The bottom of the spring is being pulled down by gravity and up by the tension of the spring. These forces cancel out, stopping the bottom of the spring from falling until the top reaches it. Until there's no more tension, and then the top passes the bottom and the whole thing falls. That is how it works. But here is the real question. Will it happen differently with a longer spring? Huh? Well, I just happen to have a longer spring! Let's max it out! Bring it. Don't tangle it. So, now that I'm up high on this fire escape, let's test it out. OK, three, two, one, go! A longer spring still has the same forces working on it. The tension of the spring pulling it up and gravity pulling it down. No matter what size of spring, these forces cancel out for the bottom of the spring until the top meets up with it. So there you go, an almost gravity-defying spring! <laughs> uh, hey, there's no door handle on this door. I guess I have to take the stairs. Whoa. <laughs> Oops. Uh, an egg. Now, you might think of eggs as kind of flimsy, and they do break pretty easily, but eggs are cool. <laughs> Eggs are actually stronger than you think. It's because they're well, egg shaped. You see, the top of the egg is like a little bit of an arch, and the bottom of the egg is also like an arch. And arches distribute the weight, just like they do in a bridge. Here's how you can experiment with how strong eggs are. First, you want to get a pair of gloves to protect your hands from the shell, just in case anything goes wrong. You should also tell an adult that you're doing this experiment, because if it does go wrong, you're going to have some mess to explain. And also, you should probably put on some safety glasses. Now, here's what you do. Take your egg and carefully put it in your palm just like that. And put it against your other palm, and you're going to push in directly on either side of the egg. Start pushing harder and harder. You can even lace your fingers and press even harder. And if you do it right, the egg won't break. Pretty amazing, right? So just how much weight does an egg hold? Can one egg? support my entire weight. Let's find out. I'm gonna lift my weight up like this and lower myself down. And no, cannot hold my weight. Can my weight be supported by two eggs? Oh, 
Nope. Phil's wait for eggs. <laughs> Oh, I thought they were gonna do it. Nope. My weight on eight eggs. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> My weight can be supported by just eight eggs. Science! <laughs> Ooh, careful. Magnetic honey in 60 seconds. This is magnetic putty. Thank you. This is magnetic putty. Ten take. This is magnetic putty. Twenty-six. This is magnetic putty. Two thousand six hundred and thirty-five. This is yeah, this is magnetic putty. I can't count this high. This is magnetic putty. <laughs> magnetic! Oh. oh, it's not a magnet. It's attracted to magnets. Oh, that makes more sense. This is magnetic putty, and this is a magnet. The putty is made of polymers, which means it can flow over itself. It also has lots of iron filings in it, which is why it's attracted to magnets. This is what happens over several minutes. And there you go, magnetic putty. This is water. Things float on water, like pool noodles and wood and toy boats. And now we're gonna do an experiment with how paint floats on water. How's this supposed to work again? Oh! I'm supposed to take the paint out of the can first. This is a fun experiment you can do at home. All you need is a container, some water, and paint. But not just any paint, special paint you use for hydro dipping. That's hydro, meaning water, and dipping, meaning uh, dipping. Carefully pour the paint on the water and add a few different colors. Then take a stick to swirl it up into a pattern. Then you get something you want to paint, and you carefully put it in like so, but don't pull it out as soon as you get it in. You have to spread the paint away because it'll stick when you bring it back out. And then when you pull it out, whoa, hydro dip. Let that dry and then you have a very cool painted toy. Let's do some other stuff. This is a bike helmet. If you put tape on what you're painting, you can remove it later to make parts that aren't painted. Skateboard! Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Now to max it out. Hydro dip pants! Wearing the pants when you do this is super messy and not something you should try at home. But the results weren't bad. <laughs> Science pants! Science pants! Science pants. One of the ways you can experience the power of water is watching it wash away dirt. You can experiment with this yourself by making your own erosion table. To make your own, fill a plastic tub with sand and tilt it up. Cut a hole in the tub at the low end and put a hose with a trickle of water at the high end. Then to complete your model, fill it with a little happy town. This small model shows how rivers cut their course to the ocean by following the lowest point. Try to design your town and the layout of the ground so the river goes around the buildings. I'll see you later. I'm gonna take a swim in the river now. There are lots of ways to experiment. Change the amount of water or the steepness of the angle. Look at the soil, it's all getting eroded over here. Or the way the town is laid out. Every time you do it, the river goes in a different direction. And have fun. Oh, phew, I'm, I'm tired, I'm just gonna lie down. And that is the power of water. This is a basketball. It bounces. This is a golf ball. It bounces. But it never bounces as high as where I dropped it from. But watch as I put the golf ball on top of the basketball. Whoa! Why does the golf ball bounce higher than where I dropped it from? How is this possible? I only bounce the golf ball from one meter high. So what's going on? 
Well, as the basketball hits the ground, it compresses, storing the potential energy of its bounce, about to give that energy back as it bounces up again. But this energy works as a springboard for the golf ball. And since the golf ball has a lot less mass than the basketball, the upwards kinetic energy of the basketball is given to the golf ball. So, let's max it out. Ball, on a ball, on a ball. Three ball bounce. Ball, on a ball, on a ball, on a ball. Quadruple ball bounce. Oh. 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 No, wait. Turns out getting four balls to drop straight down on top of each other is pretty difficult. So, we know the mass of the ball is important. Why don't we max it out in a different way? This is a Swiss ball for exercising. It has a lot more mass than a golf ball. So let's try it out. There you go. The transfer of energy between balls. A great way to lose golf balls. Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. What about this? Is this what we're gonna use? We went to the Natural Resource Canada's CanMet Materials Laboratory, which is a federal research lab. Oh, this is good. Oh, look at that! Oh, can, is this what we're using? I uh, know. Oh, it's I actually, can use this. Hold on, uh, let me figure this out. Maybe, maybe later. What, really? It's, it's just over here. CMAT is the largest research center in Canada dedicated to metals and materials research. This is it. This oh, is yeah, it. All right! Hydraulic press. How much force does this apply? This can do two million pounds. That's over 900,000 kilograms. Which is about 20 cars. <laughs> Let's crush some stuff! Crushing! Oh, crushing! We gotta get the stuff. We gotta get the stuff. Okay. We started out with the piece of wood which defeated our last press. And go! Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> How's that sound? Reverse it. it turned our wood into a pancake. Whoa, totally flatten. So it was time to try some other stuff. We crushed a ball of plasticine. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that is neat. You sort of made a rainbow. Yeah. Aluminum foil. Aluminum foil. Yes, it is now a solid plate of aluminum. <laughs> and a basketball. Basketball. Good thing we, we got these earplugs in because when it pops, it'll be loud. What? Never mind. Oh, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> this hydraulic press was so maxed out, we had to think of the toughest stuff to crush. We crushed hockey pucks. A safe. <laughs> we crushed a hydraulic jack with the hydraulic press. Whoa. This is a metal vice. Hard, strong. Yeah, it's steel. Heavy steel. Whoa, look at this bend. Start cleaning all that stuff up, yeah, huh? I think so. Okay, reverse. Mmm, a delicious plate of cheese and crackers, my favorite snack. But these crackers are pretty salty, so I should probably pour myself a glass of water first, huh? Yeah. No, my cheese and crackers! Why? Why does this happen? 
happen? Why does the water stick to the glass? Well, because of science. And the reason why it happens gets a little complicated, but it boils down to this one simple thing. Water likes to stick to things. Huh? huh? Did you see? Did you see how it stuck? No, of course you didn't. You know why? Because it only sticks on a small scale. See those drops of water? That's water sticking to the surface. But it only works when the surface tension of the water is less than the force of gravity, which is why water drops fall when they get bigger. So it sticks to things. That still doesn't explain why you can pour water out of some containers without any drips, and other containers make it nearly impossible. <laughs> It's all about the angle. Water will flow very easily when there isn't a large change in direction, like around the curved top of this glass. But when there's a big change in direction, like at the mouth of this teapot, the water can't make that turn as easily. This is also why pouring from a full glass is much messier than one that's less full. Pouring out of a full glass, the water only needs to change direction this much to flow down the side. But from a half full glass, the water would need to change direction this much. So all this happens because water likes to stick to things. So let's do an experiment and coat this glass with hydrophobic spray. Now, hydrophobic coatings repel water. So if it's repelling the water from the outside of the glass, will we still have the same problem? Well, let's find out. Hydrophobic coated glass, non-hydrophobic coated glass, or just regular glass. Water likes to stick to surfaces, but it can't stick to one coated in hydrophobic coating. That's impressive. Should we try something else? Well, that's one way to solve the dribbling glass problem. Except you can't coat your glasses at home with hydrophobic coating because it's not good to eat. The secret is using a container that has a very sharp angle between where you're pouring the water and the underside of the glass, like this jug. And there you go. Now I can enjoy a nice glass of water with my cheese and crackers. Uh, oh, right, I am. Um, wait, hold on, I can re, I will remake the crackers into, see, look, see, it's just, it's fine. It's fine, I'm not really gonna eat that, I'm just kidding. Chris and I are maxing out our hydraulic crusher. Yes, yes, before we get to that, I have a little game I wanna play. Okay, great. Great, you can pick either the small one. The big or one. Bigger. Okay. <laughs> so what's the game? Simple thumb war, uh, I'm gonna press down this side, you press down that side, we'll see you win. Okay, okay ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Oh, wow, that was really tough. Why was that so hard? Well, Phil, I'm just really strong. Wait a minute, my turn. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yeah, ah, see, pushing down on this one is way easier. You wouldn't it think is. that the small syringe would be easier. Why is that? The reason for it is, is that you have to push this one down a lot farther than you have to push this one down. Okay, see. see. See how oh, far yeah. this one goes and this one's barely This one moving. travels much more. This is how we can exchange a little bit of force over a long distance. That's right. To a, a little bit of distance at a lot of force. That's exactly right. Just like the lever, it's a mechanical advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's hydraulic advantage. That's right. Chris and I push down on small syringes, which gives us more force on our larger syringes. Our crusher was ready to go. Ooh, how about an orange? One, two, three. We squeeze down and... Oh! Oh! <laughs> then we tried a walnut. Are you allergic to nuts? I am not. One, two, three. Oh! Oh! When we tried a golf ball, we reached the limit of what our plastic syringes and our hands could do. We need to come up with a stronger, more awesome crushing machine using hydraulics. That's right, I have some ideas. Okay, good, we can go to, we can use metal. We can use metal. And we can, and use... we can go bigger as well. Ew, this water is gross, but I'm gonna drink this water. Why? Well, because of science. No, but I'm not gonna drink the water like this. First, I'm gonna use the power of science to help me clean it. How? By using gravel. Gravel, yes, gravel. So, say I've got some dirty water, and there are particles floating in that water. Large particles, your rocks, your wood, these styrofoam bits will act as the large particles. You pour it into the gravel, and the large particles get filtered out. See, nothing but clean, clean water. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, Phil, that's not really clean yet. That's because we haven't done step two, sand. Sand? Yes, sand. Let's say that these plastic beads are small particles. That filters out the tinier stuff. There, huh? 
clean, right? Uh, no, it's not very clean. So we filter the water in the next step with charcoal. What? Charcoal? Yes, charcoal. Charcoal works just like gravel and sand, except on a microscopic scale. Say these bits are tiny particles you can't even see. The charcoal catches these like the sand and gravel caught the larger particles. This is called a gravel, sand, and charcoal filter. The gravel catches the big particles, the sand the smaller ones, and the charcoal the microscopic ones. These kinds of filters are used all over the world to clean drinking water. Ah. Delicious. Science. Mouse trap. Uh, um, like I said, we are going to be using uh, <laughs> mouse traps. Mouse traps as a form of <gasps> ah, propulsion. That's the force that makes things go. And we are going to be making a boat go. And what is the thing that's going to make this boat go? A mouse. Uh, oh. Oh, it's not set. Sorry, I'm really jumpy. Anyway, we're gonna be using a mouse trap. And don't worry, no mice are gonna be harmed in the making of this or any Science Max episode, but mouse traps are really great because they can store energy in the spring. If you see, there's a spring that makes this bar want to snap back, but we can put energy into the spring and store it and then use that energy as it unwinds the spring to propel our boat but it's a little more complicated than just this. So come on, I'll show you. What we're gonna do is build this. This is the mousetrap boat, and it works like this. I've got the mousetrap, and it's attached to a long arm. That arm has a string on it, and it goes around the paddle wheel, and as the mousetrap unwinds, the paddle wheel spins like that, which pushes the boat forward. Now, it looks kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple to make, and here's what you need. My mousetrap boat is made with styrofoam, craft sticks, and elastics. You'll also want a pencil, plastic drink caps, a shish kebab skewer, small zip ties, string, and of course, your mousetrap. Now, mousetraps can hurt your fingers, so get an adult to help you when you use it. Start with two pieces of styrofoam. I like to cut mine into this shape, but the only really important thing is that they're the same size. Your paddle wheel is made from a circle of styrofoam with it penciled through the middle, and it will go across like this. To make the paddle wheel, I use cut pieces of craft stick, or they can be plastic, and make some cuts and then put them in like this, and that is what will make your paddles on the paddle wheel, because that's the wheel and that's the paddle. Paddle wheel. <laughs> that's why they call it that. Stick drink caps to the ends of the pencil after sticking it through the styrofoam. I like to use a few craft sticks and elastics to help give the styrofoam strength. Next is the mousetrap, which you want to glue down to a frame of four craft sticks. Attach the frame to the boat with elastics, then attach the shish kebab skewer or a pencil to the mousetrap with zip ties. I like to put some craft sticks on the end to make it easier to tie the string to it. Wrap the other end around the paddle wheel pencil, and remember you need enough string so that your stick can lie flat. Okay. Let's try it out. Wind up the paddle wheel. This'll be a little hard as the spring will pull back, but that's where you're storing the energy. And when it's wound up, put it in the water and... Let it go. The paddle wheel turns because the mouse trap is transferring energy that we put in earlier, and it goes all the way. We stored the energy in the tension of the spring. Now that tension is pulling the mouse trap, the stick, and the string, which turns the paddle wheel and makes the boat go. Mouse trap powered boat! If you want more detailed instructions or other designs, look up Mousetrap Boat. And there you have it, the Mousetrap Powered Paddle Wheel Boat. And this is what we're going to max out today. Come on. Our maxed out Mousetrap Boat isn't the only way to give a boat propulsion. Let's look at another way using a balloon. Let's make a balloon-powered boat. All you need for that is something to be your boat and a balloon. Then you attach them together. Actually, the best way to do it is use a straw and attach the balloon to the straw using an elastic band. And then you attach it to your boat using more elastic bands, just like this. I put a nice tape 
top on the boat to make it look awesome. And I also put a little bit of a riser here using just anything plastic to keep the straw nice and straight because the question is, will our balloon powered boat work better if it's pushing in the air or if it's pushing in the water? Well, let's do a science experiment and find out. First version in the air. <laughs> Oh, almost all the way. Now let's try it with the straw like this so it pushes into the water. Whoa, it works so much better. Why? Because water is denser than air. The air coming out of the straw has to push against something to make the boat move. Water has more mass than air, so pushing against water has a better result. Now, let's max it out. This is an air compressor. Well, actually, that is the air compressor. You see, the engine here pushes air into this tank, which works sort of like the balloon. And then it goes out this long hose, which sort of works like a straw. So let's make a maxed out air powered boat. Ready? Just like the small boat, pushing against the air doesn't produce much thrust. Huh, not so great. But now let's put it in the water. Pushing against the water gives me much more thrust because water is more dense than air. <laughs> Maxed out air powered boat! Maxed out air powered boat! Yeah! Whoa. Uh, uh, that's, that's not me. Better sandcastles in 80 seconds. Building sandcastles is fun, but you can't use dry sand because it doesn't stay up very well. You have to use wet sand. But even if you use wet sand, it doesn't hold a lot of weight. But if you use sand with the power of science, it does hold the weight. Dry sand, wet sand, science sand. Here's what's going on. Say these ping pong balls are grains of sand. When they're dry, they don't hold together very well. That's why you can't build a sand castle out of dry sand. But if you get the sand wet a little bit, the grains of sand will hold together a little better because of the surface tension of the water. That's why it's easier to build a sand castle with wet sand, but they still won't hold much weight. But if you add something that creates even more friction between the grains of sand, like say, this sandpaper, it will hold the weight. So here's what you do. Take window screen and cut it into circles. Make sure you get an adult's permission first, okay? Deal? Put in a layer of sand, pack it down, and put in a circle of window screen. And a layer of sand, pack it down, circle of window screen. Then, you guessed it, layer of sand, pack it down, circle of window screen. The window screens are gonna add more friction between the grains of sand and will make your sand castle strong. Strong with the power of science. And then, you can put lots of weight on it. And there you go. Sand with the power of science. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, I had to max it out. Let's see how strong science sand really is. Huh? Ha 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 ha. Science! This is hydrophobic coating. Hydrophobic literally means afraid of water, but it's not actually afraid of water. The chemistry of a hydrophobic coating prevents water molecules from penetrating anything you spray it on. You can get this stuff at the hardware store, and if you want, be science maximites, you can get an adult, and think of the coolest thing you could spray with hydrophobic coating. I like to use things that do not go well when you put them in water, like uh, tissue. Yeah, doesn't look great when it gets wet. Here's a tissue coated in hydrophobic coating. Huh? Weird. Or it works the same with a paper towel. Paper towel in water, paper towel 
covered in hydrophobic coating stays dry. Or how about a dinner roll? Dinner rolls really don't like water. See, gross. But a dinner roll coated in hydrophobic coating? Weird. Just don't eat it. Now it's time to max it out. I have coated half of my lab coat in hydrophobic coating and the other half I have not. Hydrophobic coating, regular lab coat. Half of me is wet and half of me is dry. What's more, half of my outfit ended up being wet and half dry because the lab coat was protecting my outfit from getting wet. Now it's time to max it out even more. We have coated my entire outfit in hydrophobic spray. My shirt, my pants, and my lab coat. The pants have been taped to rubber boots, so no water's getting in there. And my shirt has been taped to my pants, so no water's getting in there. So here's the question. Can I get into the pool and out of the pool and stay dry? Let's find out. In the pool, out of the pool, and I'm still mostly dry. Now here's what really happened. I got into the pool, and I realized I should have duct taped the pocket, because all the water went in there, down into the rubber boots, started filling up the rubber boots, and now my entire leg is full of water because the hydrophobic coating isn't letting it come out. So the hydrophobic coating isn't keeping the water out, now it's keeping the water in. Let's take a closer look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. OK. All right, let's watch it back. When the sign hits me, I exert a force on the sign in the opposite direction. That makes the sign stop moving. It also exerts an equal force on me, causing me to fly off in this direction. Now, if I was to push this sign, I'm not only pushing the sign this way, but my feet are pushing against the ground in the opposite direction. It's, um, well, it's really easier to see if I'm not standing on the ground. Um, no, oh, hold on. Okay, so, huh? Oh, okay. So, now that I'm hanging, watch. I push on the sign, but when I exert force on the sign to make it go this way, I go that way. Well, actually, it's, it doesn't work as well because the sign isn't as heavy as I am. So wait, I have this over here. This is a, a barrel, and it has stuff in it, and it weighs as much as I do. OK, so watch. If I push on the barrel like that, I go away from it as much as it goes away from me. So. There you have it. Newton's. Newton's third. No, hold on. Newton's. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. OK, go. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. cradle, and it's a really cool toy that demonstrates all kinds of laws of motion, including Newton's third law. Newton's what third you do is you pull this one ball out, and when it hits these balls, they exert force on that ball to make it stop moving, but it exerts force on these balls, which travels through the balls and makes this one in the end fly out, like that. Now, there's a lot going on here, but you can really see how the force is equal that you put in and you get out if you use two balls. I swing two balls up and two balls go out that side. Isn't that cool? Now, it wouldn't be science max unless we maxed it out, so come on. Whoa, OK. This is one we built out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Bowling balls. <laughs> Instead of smaller balls. And I think it's going to work the same way. Let's find out. You throw one out, and, and <laughs> yeah, it works the same. OK, now let's try it with two balls. OK, ready? Wait, 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 wait. And two balls, throw them out. And two balls on that side. All right, so there you have it. Whoa. Newton's third law. Oh. Ah. Newton's uh. third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction.
Here's another fun way you can play with elastic force. Take a milk carton, I prefer Science Max Milk because it's the creamiest. 2% cream, 100% science. Wrap some elastic bands around it with some popsicle sticks on the bottom, sort of like feet. Then take some clamshell packaging, which wraps just about anything you buy nowadays, and cut out a square or a rectangle. Then wrap some tape around that square with an elastic in it and put the elastic on the feet of your milk carton. Then wind it around and make sure you go backwards so your paddle wheel boat will go forwards when you put it in the water. And there you go, a paddle wheel boat. Now it is time to max it out. Mattress, I need, I need a, a better name. But I've made a giant paddle wheel boat that will work on elastic force because I've got surgical tubing as my elastics, and that's an air mattress. And then I use some lumber to hold it all together. And of course, I need a paddle wheel, and what better thing to use in a pool than a flutter board? Okay, here we go. So normally you're not allowed to wear your clothes and your shoes in the pool, but I got special permission because of science. Besides, I'm not worried at all, so I didn't wear my swimming outfit because I figure I can totally do this entire experiment without even getting wet. That is how confident I am. All right, now the tricky part, We'll be getting on to the mattress. Okay, here we go. Ha <laughs> ha! Whoa! Ha <laughs> ha! The SS Science! Hey, SS Science, that's a great name for this. Look, it works great, and I managed to stay totally dry. Huh? Well, almost. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you thought I was gonna fall in the pool, but I didn't. Uh-oh. My flutterboard has has stopped moving and I'm I'm in the middle of the pool. Almost. Yeah. Didn't think this through. No. 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 No, that's not going to work. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll wait. This is a climbing frog. Why does he climb? Because of science. I pull on this rope, and then I pull on that rope, and I pull on that rope, and that rope, and he climbs up the ropes. And why? Well, because of friction. The secret is two straws. The straws are pointed away from each other at the bottom. This allows it to climb thanks to friction. Take a closer look. When I pull on one string, it pulls straight, which makes the frog pivot. That string slips through the straw because there's not a lot of friction. But there's lots of friction on the other side because of the angle. So one side of the string goes down, which makes the other go up, which means the frog goes up with it. All thanks to friction. So now, let's max it out. This is a super maxed out uh, climbing frog. Just like the small version, I have a rope going through two tubes. I pull on one rope and the other holds on by friction. Then I switch. And it does work. It's just a lot harder to pull on the ropes. But it totally works. Whoa, guess what? There, and then this one, and then that one, and then that one. Yeah! <laughs> a giant climbing frog! <laughs> All because of friction. Here's another way to defy gravity using friction. Get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice. Take two. So get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice using a funnel. Then take a shish kebab skewer and stick it into the bottle and 
nothing happens. But if you tap the bottle down, the rice starts to pack in a little bit better. See how the level of rice is lower? Which means you can add more rice. Pack it down even more. And you can even use something the same diameter as the mouth of the bottle, like, say, a highlighter. And make sure all the rice is as packed in as you can get it. There. Now the rice is really packed in there. And when I stick the shish kebab skewer in, the friction between the pieces of rice and this wood is enough to lift the bottle using nothing but friction. Now, let's max it out. I filled this 20 liter water cooler jug full of rice and it's really, it's really heavy. I wanted to see if I could lift it using nothing but friction and this dowel, which is just a round piece of wood. All right, here we go. Ah, <laughs> science! I'd max it out even more, but I don't think I could lift anymore. It's okay, I can just fit. Um. Newton's first law in 60 seconds. Newton's first law says an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So, why don't they? See, if I was to throw this, it doesn't stay in motion, it doesn't keep going, it slows down and falls to the ground. Well, the whole law states an object in motion tends to stay in motion until an external force acts upon it. So what forces are acting upon this? Well, gravity for one, pulling it down towards the ground, and friction, specifically air friction, slowing this down and making it stop. Now, if you were to have something very light with a lot of surface area, it would really be affected by air friction. You wouldn't be able to throw it very far at all, no matter how hard you tried. So there you go. Newton's first law, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless it's affected by an external force such as friction, like air friction. So there you go. Help, I'm being crushed by all this pressure. A whole kilogram is being pushed down on every square centimeter of my body. 103 kilopascals, ah! Actually, one kilogram for every square centimeter on your body is the exact kind of pressure that you and I are under at all times, every day. We don't notice it because we're used to it, but it sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Well, it is. Here's an experiment you can do with a plastic bottle. Say, at room temperature, there are 10 million air molecules in here. Doesn't really matter how many, but we'll say there's 10 million at normal room temperature. What happens if I heat up the air inside this bottle? This is warm water. What I'm trying to do is heat up the air inside the bottle because the air molecules, when they get hotter, move faster and need more room. So the 10 million air molecules are starting to escape out the mouth of the bottle and reducing the number of air molecules inside. And now I take the bottle out and cap it. Because the air molecules heated up and speeded up, they needed more room, now there's less of them in the bottle. There's about four million air molecules inside this bottle, but they're all hot air molecules and they have a higher pressure and you don't notice it because the air out here isn't crushing the bottle. But watch what happens if I cool the air inside the bottle. This is ice water. So what's happening now is the molecules are slowing down and they need less space. So they need less room and they're being crushed by the pressure on the outside of the bottle. Ha <laughs> It has been crushed because the colder air molecules don't need the same kind of room as the hot air molecules. The room temperature air has crushed the bottle. The air inside has a lower pressure than the air outside. Pretty amazing even more amazing when we max it out. This is a steel drum. What we've done is we put some water in it and we're heating it up to boiling so there's nothing but hot air inside the drum. This is an airtight cap, which we use to seal the drum. And now we cool the drum off. Hey Trevor, give me a hand. Ready? One, two, three, you lift. That's good. This pool is filled with ice. What we're doing now is cooling off the steel drum, which will cool off the air inside it. 
which means eventually the air inside the steel drum will be a much lower pressure than the air outside the steel drum. Because the steel drum has a lot more volume than a two liter pop bottle, it takes a lot longer for the air to cool down. The other thing to think about is that it's a steel drum. I could stand on it and it wouldn't even dent. But sure enough, after a few minutes, Whoa! Check it out. The barrel has totally crushed. The low pressure air inside the barrel wasn't enough to withstand the force of the regular air pressure that you and I walk through every day. The air pressure all around us is enough to crush a steel drum. How cool is that? Here is something mind bending you can do with pulleys. These buckets are attached to the table through a pulley. There's nothing holding this table up except for the weight of the buckets pushing down on the table. So if I took the buckets off the table, the weight of the buckets pulls the table up. But because the buckets are on the table, everything is in balance. Mind bending, right? Okay, wait, it gets better. If I took a weight and I put it on the table, the weight of the buckets isn't enough to keep the table up. So I have to add more weight to the buckets so the buckets pull the table up. Whoa. And there you have it. It's weird, it's mind bending, it's science. Pressure happens when you squeeze something or compress it. Solids do not compress very well. I will demonstrate. Um, solid? Is it compressing? No, okay. Liquids don't compress very well either. You can demonstrate this for yourself by getting a plastic water bottle and filling it right to the very top with water and putting on the cap and squeezing. You'll find that you can't really squeeze the bottle very much. But if you empty out half of the water, no, don't pour it on the floor, and then put the cap back on the bottle and try to squeeze it, you'll find that you can squeeze it a lot more. That's because gases compress much easier than solids or liquids. Here's what's going on. Say this container is, well, any container. And these magnets are air molecules. Now I'm gonna put the magnets in pole to pole so they repel each other and wanna stay a certain distance apart, just like air molecules do. There we go, a container at normal gas pressure. Now watch what happens when I add more gas molecules. They start to get squeezed together. And if I add more, the amount of space that each one gets is less and less. Now this container is under a lot of pressure. These molecules really want to escape through the top of the container, but they can't because I'm holding them down. If I took something like this plunger and I pushed them down even more, now they're really under pressure. They want to get out, but they can't because I'm holding them in. Now watch what happens when I let them go. They all pop out the top and the container has returned to normal gas pressure. That's what happens when we put gas in a container like this one. These containers that hold compressed gas are made out of solid steel because you need something really strong or it might explode if you put too much gas pressure in it. That's why these are only filled up by professionals who know exactly how much pressure it can take. That is the power of pressure. Mmm, this science is delicious. This is rock candy. It's basically crystallized sugar and you make it by turning a solid into a liquid and then back to a solid again. Here's how you can make it at home. You need a container that you're not gonna need for a while, and some water, some sugar, you can use brown or white, I like to use brown, and an adult. Here's why you need an adult. You wanna dissolve three cups of sugar into every cup of water, and you can't do that unless you heat the water. So get an adult, a saucepan, and heat the water up, pour the sugar in, and keep stirring until it's all dissolved. Then pour it in your container and let it cool down. Then you'll need a shish kebab skewer, which is something you can get at the grocery store. Cut it down to the right size so it fits nicely into your container. And then 
Dunk it in your sugar and get some crystals coated around the stick. These are seed crystals and they get the whole process started. And now you have to wait for these to dry, otherwise they'll just fall off the stick when you put it in the water. So I've got one here that has dried out. You'll also want something to keep it from falling in the top of the container, so I'm gonna use a clothespin. Put it in there and dunk it in the container like that. And now for the final step, if you want, you can add food coloring. I like to use red because it reminds me of science. And I'm gonna use the stick to actually stir that up a little bit. There we go. Now, the dissolved sugar crystals in the water will slowly grow on the crystals that are already attached to the stick, and it will eventually grow into a rock candy pop. But it takes about a week. No, I'm just kidding, I've already got one that's standing by. Here we go. This one has been growing for about seven days. And there you go, rock candy. Delicious science. Now, how could we make this any better? I mean, it's crystallized sugar. It doesn't get any more maxed out than that, does it? Yeah, it does, come on. This is a giant container of sugar water, and I've been brewing a massive rock candy uh, crystal in it for a while, but uh, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of getting a little bit too big to fit out the top of the container, so. Uh, um, you know what, I'm just gonna put that back in there and chalk that one up to science because, well, eating a rock candy crystal that big would definitely not be good for my teeth, so, yeah. Today, we're taking a closer look at chemistry. Ooh. Chemistry is the science of atoms and molecules, the things that make up all matter, and how they interact with each other. Take, for example, this glow stick. Actually, don't take it, because I, I, I kind of need it. The glow stick doesn't glow until you... Um, the glow stick doesn't glow until you break the barrier and mix the two chemicals, and they start to glow. Huh? Pretty cool, huh? Chemistry! Now, the chemical reaction we're looking at today is the old vinegar and baking soda volcano. But this reaction doesn't have anything to do with volcanoes. It's chemistry. Now, this experiment is totally safe, but I do recommend you get an adult's permission before you do it, because it's very messy. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> First, you're gonna want baking soda, and vinegar, these are your two main ingredients, but you'll also want dish soap and red food coloring if you want it to look a little bit more like lava. Now, I like to mix the baking soda, red food coloring, and dish soap together with a little warm water, so all you have to do is add the vinegar. And when you do, this is what happens. And there you go, chemical reaction. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how much vinegar or baking soda do I use? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. This is where you can be science maximites. Try different amounts. More vinegar, more baking soda, more dish soap. Who knows? Write down the amounts each time you use it and find out what amounts work best. That's called science. Today, we're combining two different chemicals to create a reaction. Sometimes chemicals can combine in a way that makes them very different from how they started out. For example, this is sodium, or Na, on the periodic table. Now, the sodium tablets are in mineral oil because sodium reacts very strongly with water, even the water in the air, or especially the water in my skin. Watch what happens when I drop a sodium tablet into this beaker of water. Very cool and very dangerous. And this is chlorine, or Cl, on the periodic table. Chlorine gas is very poisonous. 
So, <clears throat> so what happens if we combine these two deadly substances? Do we create some sort of super poison? Something more deadly than anything else known to science that causes fear and chaos in chemistry labs all over the land? No, we create salt. Good old normal table salt. These two substances combine to make N-A-C-L, salt. Something completely and totally safe. Chemistry. Oh, oh, oh. Building a door in a wall is hard because how do you make a big gaping hole in your wall without your wall falling over? Well, people have come up with lots of ways to put doors and windows in walls made of stone blocks over the centuries. And you can do this at home with books like I'm doing or with building blocks. Just go up until you're happy with the height and then stack each next layer a little closer to the middle until the final layer touches just like this. And then you take a big heavy book and you drop it right on top. And it's pretty stable and you've just made a doorway. It works even better if it's part of a wall because you want extra weight on the outside of these books here. So of course, I had to build one that was part of a whole wall. This is the same corbelled arch built out of little building blocks. And as you can see, I went closer and closer together until it meets at the top, and it is very strong. Whoa, ha ha! Now, let's max it out. The kind of arch we're building is a corbelled arch. And the Science Max build team and I are using pieces of wood cut to different lengths. How high can it go? We can use my head to, no, okay, wait, wait. It takes a while to get together, but once it's done, it looks just like the kinds of doorways stone buildings had in ancient times. Ta-da, there you go, a maxed out corbelled arch. We went straight up until we got to these layers and they got a little bit closer and closer to the middle until the last piece is one big solid piece. And if we built this right, it should be strong enough to hold me up. Yeah! Science! Woo well, it held me up for a minute, didn't it? The shape of something makes a big difference in how strong it is. Get some toilet paper rolls and put them in a square and then stack books on top of them. They can hold, wait, thing is, they can actually hold a lot more weight than you probably think. In fact, the amount of weight, just paper, in a tube can hold is really kind of impressive. Ha <laughs> And now, woo, let's max it out. weight on two toilet paper rolls. Nope, Bill's weight on four toilet paper rolls. Nope, Bill's weight on six toilet paper rolls. Nope, Bill's weight on 10 toilet paper rolls. Oh. Ha! Ha ha! Bill's weight can be supported by 10 toilet paper rolls. But what if Bill jumps? <laughs> Didn't really work. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the balloon-powered car. Here's how it works. It all has to do with Newton's third law. 
Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, we don't we don't have to do this now. We can this is all for later. We can build the cars first and then we can uh let's go over here. So how do you build a balloon-powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon-powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built. But I will give you some tips, though, that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster. And then you stick the balloon on there and it allows you to attach something to the car and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this, you can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Duh. This one I made out of paper plates, and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car, because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, the dragster model. It's a long broom handle, and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars, because I can race them. Sunday, 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 at the Science Maxadrome. It's the balloon power car winner take all drag race of awesome. First up, the Eliminator. <laughs> Woohoo! Better late than never, it's the Procrastinator. <laughs> Crushing the competition, it's the Terminator! <laughs> Feel the chill of the refrigerator! <laughs> And last but not least, the um, regurgitator. <sighs> well, when you build your balloon powered cars, you can figure out what worked or uh, what didn't work and try modifying your designs to make them work even better. That is science. Inertia, what is it? Well, it's directly related to Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion tends to stay in motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Let's do an experiment. Here is an object. Right now, it's at rest. You might think that means it has no inertia, but that's not true. Inertia just means an object's tendency to keep doing what it is doing. Right now, it's doing nothing. But if I wanted to overcome its inertia, I would have to put energy in. And now that I have, it is moving on its own. It has inertia. If I wanted to stop it, I would have to overcome its inertia, its tendency to keep moving. There. I went exactly that far. Now, 
let's max it out. I'm adding uh, uh, these weights to the cart. Now it has a lot more mass, which means it has a lot more inertia and its tendency to do nothing. But this time it has a lot more inertia. If I wanted to get it going the same speed as before, I'd have to put in a lot more effort. Uh, there, now it's going the same speed as before, but now it has way more inertia, so stopping it will be harder. Ah! Ah! So there you go, inertia. A thing's tendency to stay moving or stay still, and the more mass, the more inertia. <sighs> Dear Phil, I can't believe you did a whole episode on boat propulsion and you didn't use the greatest thing out there for making a boat move, a propeller. Sincerely, a fan. Well, let's talk about propellers. Oh, good thing this is fan mail. <laughs> Get it? Because it's a fan? Anyway. A fan pushes air just like a boat propeller pushes water. They're both fluids and they behave in the same way. Now, if you look closely at a fan, it's curved on the blades. The air or water is caught under at this side and then it's pushed out on the curve to make it go that way. And the faster it spins, the better it works. Now, this is a propeller powered boat. And what you do is wind up the propeller. I have an elastic band here to store the amount of energy I put in and then you put it in the water, the propeller spins, and the boat goes forwards. It's being propelled by the propeller. <laughs> That's why you call it that. Awesome, right? Well, now we'll max it out. This is a drill. It spins. And this is a propeller, and when you put it in the water and spin it, it provides thrust. So let's try it out. Whoa! Remember not to try this at home. I am a trained professional. This is a very small propeller. Let's compare. This, th this is a super maxed out propeller. Whoa, okay, let's try it out. Whoa! The larger a propeller is, the more energy you need to turn it, and the more propulsion you get out. This is a chain of beads, and this is a uh, glass. Now, if I was to drop the chain of beads, what will happen? It will fall. Yes, that's right, it'll fall because of gravity, but watch this. This side goes up. Why? Because of gravity. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why does one side go up because of gravity? Well, it gets a little complicated, but I can explain. Um, but I think I should, I'll have to put the beads back in the glass. Okay, so what's going on? Well, when this part of the chain starts falling out, it gets longer and longer, and it has more mass than this side of the chain. And if it has more mass, then it has more inertia. And when it starts yanking out very hard, this side of the chain gets yanked up out of the glass very quickly. When it gets yanked up hard, it flies into the air. But then, of course, the direction has to change, so it goes around a curve and then goes back down. Because of the speed that it's going, that curve starts lifting up over the top of the glass. And that's how it works. There's a big difference in energy because this chain falls far. I try it from here, and it doesn't work as well. Why? Because the drop from here to here isn't as big. You want lots of force acting on the falling chain, which means the higher you do it from, the better it works. So maybe we should max it out. Yeah, but wait, we should wait for it to stop. And now let's max it out. This is a really long chain, and this is a really long drop. Let's see what happens. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that! Whoa! Super maxed out! Science! Now we're going to 
going to talk about tension. What's tension? One more than nine shin. Get it? Because tension <laughs> and nine shin. That's OK. I'll, um, because I. Tension is the force that we usually talk about when we think about pulling a rope or a chain or something like that. Because you know the old expression, you can't push a rope. But today we are going to push a rope. I have a rope right here. And I'm going to push it using another force called flexion. I've got some pieces of plastic here, and they bend or flex. And when they do, they want to spring back. But I'm going to prevent them from springing back by putting them in between these knots. Huh? And look, the rope now stays up. I take another piece, and I stick it on this knot. And then I bend it all the way. This is not terrifying. Really, it's not terrifying at all. Oh, OK, good. And then I take this piece, and I put it here, and I bend it around, and <gasps> so now we have a rope that's being pushed, and we're defying gravity, and we're making a cool art sculpture. All right, one more here. Ooh, OK, here we go. And, and. Flexing. Then, Ha-ha! <laughs> there you go. I've pushed a rope, defied gravity, and made a cool art sculpture. OK, well, I guess technically I haven't really pushed the rope because we're still pulling from each knot. And I guess I haven't really defied gravity because that one's sitting on the table and all the others are sitting on top of that. But you can't argue that I made a cool art sculpture. Ha-ha! <laughs> art! I mean, Science. This is a pendulum. It's a weight that swings. It swings back and forth. Pendulums are pretty simple. It, it swings back and forth. Predicting the path of a pendulum, pretty simple. It's going to swing back and forth. But wait, as I make it so much more complex by adding a pendulum. Now I've got a pendulum down here, and that one swings back and forth, and I've got a pendulum up here that swings back and forth. What will happen to this part of the pendulum when I let it go? Can you predict? Let's find out. This is a double pendulum, and predicting the path of a double pendulum is really difficult. It's still simple physics, but because there's a moving part attached to a moving part, it makes it way more complex. So the question is, can we max it out even more? Of course we can. These are chaos pendulums. This one's a lever, and it's got another lever on the end. Whoa. And this one here is a perfectly balanced lever, and it's got a pendulum on either side. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Scientists and engineers have always said that the more moving parts something has, the more complex they are. Science. Plastic is great, and plastic is everywhere. But the problem with plastic is it isn't very biodegradable. It, it doesn't break down in the environment. <laughs> I'm still on hold. Oh, well, there you go. Back for another couple years, I guess. But here's a way that you can make bioplastic. It's fully biodegradable because it's made of natural materials. The recipe is easy. Two parts cornstarch, three parts water a few drops of cooking oil, and some food coloring to make it whatever color you want. Purple, science purple. Mix it up, and it turns into a paste. Now what you'll need are two things. One, an adult, and two, a microwave. Put it in for 30 seconds. Clock wipe. There we go. Then take it out and mix it some more until it cools down. Then you can pull it out and use your hands to sculpt it into a shape or take the shape of something else. Once you put it all the way around, you can turn it into a little flower pot. Once you've sculpted it, you need to wait for it to dry, which will take about a day. Clock wipe. After waiting a day... Uh, uh, huh? Uh, what? It's been a day? Oh. You have something made out of bioplastic. Like this little flower pot you can use to grow a small plant. And then when it grows big enough, you can take this biodegradable flower pot and plant it right outside in the dirt, and this pot will biodegrade and turn back into dirt. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. 
biodegradable Frisbee. Check it out. It's a Frisbee, but it's biodegradable. So you throw it around in the park, but if you lose it, it turns back into dirt. <laughs> what, not enough? Okay, clock wipe. Biodegradable lawn chair. Use it for one season and then return it to the earth afterwards. I think this is one of my best science max. I Okay, bioplastic lawn chair, not as strong as regular lawn chair. We've learned that lesson now, so that's, that's good to know. I mean, I mean, how would I have known if I hadn't tried it? This is ferrofluid. It is ferromagnetic, which means it's attracted to magnets. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's not that interesting. Well, watch as I put it next to this magnet. Mm. Very interesting. And because it's a liquid, it behaves in very interesting ways. Watch this. Unlike most things ferromagnetic, like paper clips or iron filings, ferrofluid is a liquid, which means it behaves in a unique way. The spikes it creates are following the magnetic field lines of the magnet. You can see the magnetic field in 3D. It's even more impressive when we max it out. This is ferrofluid outside of a glass jar. Now, it's sitting in a pool around this electromagnet. And this is a dial which I can use to change the voltage of the electromagnet, making the magnet stronger. Watch this. Changing the current going to the spiral in the middle turns it into a magnet. The more current I put in, the stronger that magnet becomes, allowing the ferrofluid to climb the spiral to the top. And remember, even though it looks all spiky, it's still a liquid. I will demonstrate with my plastic spoon. And watch this. When I turn the magnet off, it stops being spiky. Turn it on. Turn it off. Science. Uh. The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic. And you will be granted entry. Well, Fuzzix, who is the next applicant for the Wizard Academy? Overwhelmo. Indeed it is I, Overwhelmo. And prepare to be over. Well, no. Would you be flabbergastified if I balanced this coin on its end? Not really, no. But would you be impressed if I was to balance this coin on top of this coin? Possibly. Prepare to be flustered and stupefied. Stupi. Stupid flustered as I balance three coins on their ends on top of this glass. Well, that certainly would seem like magic. Let us see. Okay. No pressure, Overwhelmo. You can do this. And now, I say, a magic word. A magic word! Ha 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 ha! And now, you must let me into your academy. Wait. What's under the cloth? What, what cloth? This cloth, nothing! Oh! Is that a magnet? This, no! The pull of the magnet is what's keeping those coins up. The magnet is just strong enough to keep the coins from falling. No, this is set, set dressing. It's just for... It was a good trick, but it's science, not magic. Well, yes. And you will see! You will see! I will be back! I, Overwhelmo, will return! And I will do such magic that you will need extra socks because I will knock them off! With my magic, you will need at least two pairs of socks, maybe three pairs of socks. We can still see you! No, you can't! Greetings, Science Maximites! Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max, we're going to be looking at gravity. What goes up must come down. Today... <laughs> gravity is the force that makes things fall. <laughs> Towards the ground. 
But just because it's a force of nature doesn't mean that we have to listen to it. No! Today on Science Max, experiments at large, we're gonna use everything in the power of science to defy gravity! Ha <laughs> ha! We are going to be making a hoop glider. Now, hoop gliders may not look like much, but they fly just like paper airplanes. Woohoo! And here's how you can make a hoop glider. Here's how you can make a hoop glider all your own. This is what you need index cards, scissors, straw, ruler, pencil, and of course, science tape, which is just like regular tape, except you use this kind of tape for science. So, here's how you do it. Take your index card and cut it into three equal lengths. Take two strips, and you take your science tape, and you tape those two strips, and make a hoop out of it. And with the small strip, you want to make another hoop. Now, what you want to do is take your straw. Now, this straw has a little scoop at the end, and that's not very aerodynamic, so we're going to get rid of that. Ooh, maybe it was kind of aerodynamic. All right, now that we've got the straw, you have to align the hoop and the straw together. So here's what I like to do. Take some science tape and stick it on the straw, and then align it so that it's perfectly straight, and then stick it on. Looks straight to me, all right? The small hoop also has to be perfectly aligned with the first hoop. So again, put the tape on the strut first, then align them up, and then start looking down through it, to make sure it's aligned. There. Once you have it all taped together, you're done your hoop glider. And it flies just like a paper airplane. Pew! Awesome. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna, we're gonna oh yeah, I gotta clean that up. This is a house of cards, and if you've never built a house of cards, you should definitely try. Try, because it's not easy. What you need to do is you need to make triangles with the cards. If you do it just right, ha ha, they'll stay up. Then you take another pair of cards, like that, and you take another card, and you put it on top. Ah, and it stays up. Keep on building by making triangles and putting another card across the top, like a roof. Then, when you're ready, you can start to make a second layer. It takes a lot of patience to make a house of cards. But with enough patience and really steady hands, you might be able to finish it. There we go. Ha ha, a house of cards. Now, let's max it out. Shh, backing away slowly. Backing away slowly. To build our maxed out card house, the Science Max build team and I used large pieces of foam insulation, which were super light and easy to work with. Once we set up the first layer, we needed to bring in a scissor lift so we could keep building the next layers. By the time we got to the top, our card house was 10 meters tall. Yeah, giant house of cards. And now that I've built a giant house of cards, what do I do with it? I knock it down. <laughs> Science! I'm gonna build it again. Whoa. This is a Prince Rupert's drop. It's a piece of glass that has a long, snaky tail and a bulb at one end. So what's so interesting about a glass tadpole? Well, I'll show you. And remember, this is just glass. Oh, Prince Rupert's drops are very strong, almost as strong as steel. It's all in how they're made. Molten glass is dropped into cold water. What happens is the outer part of the drop cools off first, leaving the inner part still hot. When the inner part eventually cools, it contracts, pulling everything in tighter and tighter, keeping it under a lot of tension. And because it's round, the force you put on it is distributed all the way around, just like the force is distributed on an arched bridge. Until you get to the tail. Just the tiniest break in the tail, and it explodes. 
all that energy is released in a chain reaction. Why it's so strong you can hammer on one end, but explodes when you break the other, puzzled scientists for centuries. But now we know it's all in how it's made. The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic, and you'll be granted entry. Send in the next applicant. <laughs> okay, don't let them see you. Don't let them see you. Okay, magic smoke, and here we go, big entrance. Behold, it is I, Overwhelm. You again. I only have to demonstrate magic one time, and you have to let me into the Wizard Academy. And last, last time does not count. So prepare for your mind to be boggled and your eyes to also be boggled because I shall do a trick. I will just get to it. Here is a book, behold! And now, feast your stupefaction as I produce another book, ha ha! And then, two or three more times, behold, as I put, as I, that's good, behold! And now, look upon the wonderment as I stack these books on top of each other, like this, and now, feast more stupefaction as I, I cleverly move the books off the table. And now, now comes the magic word. Now, I say the magic word. The magic word! And behold, the book is levitating. It is completely off the table. I have done it. Magic! No. No? Not magic, that's science. But the book is levitating. No. Look at it, it's not even touching the table. No, it's being supported by the books below because of the center of mass. Preposterous. I'm afraid it's very posterous. Each book is balanced on the one below in a way that the center of mass is behind the edge of the book below. And the entire stack's center of mass is behind the edge of the table. So it may look like magic, but it's science. So... I can't get into the Wizard Academy? No, I'm afraid not. I, uh, good... Alakazam! You will rule the day that Overwhelmo did not. I will return, and then you will see... Oh, ow. This is a bike tire. It's pretty light, but I still can't hold it from the end of the pole like this with one hand. Nope, nope. But I can if I get it spinning fast enough. I just use this drill, and then I get... Okay, so this is gonna be awfully hard to do with one person. Uh, oh, this is the perfect opportunity to use the Trevor button. Ha <laughs> ha, Trevor button. Hey, Trevor from the Science Max build team. Uh, what are you doing? Maxing this out. Oh, right on. Can you give me a hand for a second? Sure. Awesome. Okay, so you take this, this drill, and we're gonna get this wheel spinning really fast. Okay. I don't know if it's... Um... No, no, I don't wanna know. I don't know if I remembered to... No, it's fine. Max it out. We gotta max it out. So, because it's spinning, I can hold this heavy weight in the air. How is this possible? Because the wheel is basically a top. The forces that prevent a top tipping, angular momentum, are still working here. This angular momentum resists a change in direction this way, which is how gravity would want it to tip. Interestingly, these same forces also keep it spinning around me in a circle. So, I can lift the heavy weight in the air just by spinning it. Awesome max head experiment, Trevor. Yeah! What was that? It's my science confetti high five I just made. Well, you know what we should do? What? We should max it out. Yeah, we can make a giant one and then a whole bunch of confetti in it, and then people like jump up and do more confetti that would come out, right? And then so what would happen is there would be all this con Trevor? This is a string. You can pull a string, but you can't push a string. Well, you can. You can push a string, you really can. Okay, quit it, quit it. This little contraption works sort of like a baseball pitching machine, but in miniature. See, there are two motors here, and the wheels spin together to shoot things out this way. Things like this craft stick, watch this. 
Whoa! Let's watch that again. Whoa! <laughs> but now, watch as I put a large loop of string through. What? <laughs> Pushing string. How does this happen? It... Hello? I don't suppose it's the Magnus effect? Uh, no, it's not the Magnus effect. No, that's... It's all right. I'll be in my lair if you need okay. me. Okay. Right. Bye. Right. Where was I? Uh, I believe you were at, uh, the reason why this works is... Right. Pushing string. How does this happen? It's all because of inertia. Check it out. The wheels are pushing the string through fast. It's got some weight and it's got some speed, which means it has some inertia. So when it goes this way, it wants to keep going this way. But it goes all the way to the end and then, because it's a loop, gets sucked back in this way, which means all of this inertia, you can sort of overcome gravity. Pushing string. Science. <laughs> Now it's time for one of my favorite scientific terms, the Magnus Effect. I am Magnus, and behold my effect. No, the Magnus Effect has to do with things that are spinning, things like these cups. And here's a great little Magnus Effect flyer you can make at home. It's super easy. Get two styrofoam cups and tape them together at the bottoms using science tape. Then get some elastic bands and make a long one by tying them together. Take your elastic and you wrap it around the cup like this. Then hold the elastic on the bottom, remember, like that. And then let them go. They fly up and out. The reason why it goes up and stays in the air is because it's spinning, creating moving air over the top. Moving air has lower pressure, which means it's pushed up by the higher pressure underneath. And that is called the... It's coming. It's just... Oh, come on. Oh. Now, um, mm, the Magnus Effect. Yes. So, let's max it out. Magnus it out. See how much better that sounds? No, 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 max. Max it out. Check it out. Magnus Flyer 2.0 Stand Elastic Slingshot. Wrap it around. Remember, for the Magnus Effect to work, your cups need to be spinning this way. The front side rotating up. And there you have it, the Magnus Effect. Hi, Magnus am out taking over the show. It is now Science Magnus. That is my effect, slightly improving the name of science TV shows. Science Magnus. Oh, hello there. I, whoa, uh, here's a fun science experiment you can do with science and friction together. Take two books, put them on top of each other, and pull them apart. Ooh, not too much friction. But if you take the books and you interleave some of the pages, maybe three or four parts, and try it again, pull them apart, they're a little harder to pull apart. That's because the friction for more pages touching each other actually starts to add up. So. What if we were to take two books with a lot of pages and very carefully and meticulously take each page individually, one at a time, and overlay each one and go back and forth? These are two books completely shuffled together. The elastic band is actually just to hold the covers together. All right. So now the friction between all of these pages, when I try to pull it apart, makes it... <laughs> Pretty much impossible. Now, there's two things going on here. First of all, when you start to pull the books apart, the pages start to stick together because they squeeze together because you're pulling and they're squeezing. And the fact that there's so many pages sticking together, the friction builds up to a degree that is actually very impressive. But don't take my word for it. Let's max it out. Here is another two books, elastic just to hold the covers. This one, clamp to the wall, and I'm gonna pull this one. 
<laughs> Science! Still don't believe me? Well, let's max it out some more. Two books, all the pages layered together, held together only by friction, suspended over a giant bat of slime. Now, <laughs> let's see how much faith I have in science. <laughs> friction, yeah! Okay, okay, oh no. Okay, now to get down. Okay, hold on. And then... <laughs> Science! <laughs> that was close. As you may have already guessed, today is about friction. And here's a really easy friction experiment you can do at home. All you need is a piece of wood. You don't need the frame and you don't have to uh, do anything fancy to it. Just put one end up on a couch or a coffee table and make a nice ramp. Then you want something to slide down that ramp. And I like to use a piece of wood. Now check it out. Wood ramp, wood block. The friction is so much that the wood slides to there. Now what I like to do is take a little flag and mark the results. Recording the results is good science. Now here's where it gets fun. Get another surface and attach it to the wood, like carpet and wood. Let's see how far this goes. Hmm, not as good. All right, record the results. Cardboard. Ooh, nicely done, cardboard. Foam. And this wood has been waxed, like on a floor wax, which makes it nice and slippery. Let's see how that does. Ooh. And now the ultimate ice attached to wood. This is actually harder to do than I thought. All right, let's try it out. Not a big surprise right there. And get this, once you've done all of that, you can change the surface of the ramp. You can go to waxed wood, carpet, foam, cardboard. But, and, and well, yeah, you get the idea. Record all the results, compare them, and there you go. Friction ramp experiment. And that's what we're gonna be maxing out today. So come on, let's go. Six. So here we go. Amazing. The friction ramp, it's pretty simple. You just take, um, I've got blocks of wood with different surfaces. Amazing. And then you just slide them down the ramp. All right. So cool. Yeah, so what if, um, to max it out, what if this is us? We're a block of wood? N no, I mean like we are on the block of wood oh. and then we can tr try changing the bottom. I guess a block of wood isn't the right thing to use, though. Right, yeah. Maybe we could use like a, like a sled. Oh, yeah, okay, like a, right, uh, like a snow sled. Mm. That's a great idea. Okay, so yeah. we'll tell you what, I will portal in a sled for Are us. Are you sure you want to portal it in? I'm sure. Just okay. stand, just stand back, okay. though. Okay. Ha! Ah, there we go. Maxed out friction slide! You ready, Sarah? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. All right. Sarah and I pushed each other around on the sled, which was fun. <laughs> But it was also tiring. It's uh, it's pretty hard. This is a uh, my turn, my turn. All right. Oh, yeah. Whoa, friction. Yeah, friction. Yeah, yeah, friction. But we soon realized it'd be pretty hard to measure how much friction there was. You know how hard you were pushing? Like, I had no idea how hard I was pushing. A lot, but that doesn't really help in science terms. So exactly. What do we do? Well, with your first experiment, you used a ramp. Could we maybe put a ramp up in here? In here? In here, yeah. I guess. Uh... Then we can measure also how far we go so we know how much friction is being used. Right, so we have our control and then we have all the, just like the blocks. Exactly, just like the blocks. Okay, great. So we'll get the ramp, we'll get a bunch of wood, right. yes. we'll get some tools. Yeah. If you want to build a block tower. You might think the fastest way to do it is just by building a single stack of blocks. But science may have a few things to say about that, and those things would be no. Let's try it with books. The books are much wider than the blocks, so that will give me a wider base, right? But it's all about the center of mass. You compare how wide it is to how tall it is. Right now, it's pretty wide and it's not that tall, so the center of mass might be around here. 
But if you go high enough, how high it is compared to how wide it is changes a lot. It's getting higher, but not any wider. The center of mass is probably uh, right around there somewhere, which means it's gonna be really hard to balance. That, whoa, care, careful, almost. I can do a little bit more, I bet. Oh, careful, careful, whoa. It'll only get so tall. So there you go. You can never stack a single stack of anything very high. But just in case you don't believe me, let's max it out. Ah, ha, ha, oh, careful. Now it's time to see how high, whoa, whoa, how high I can make a single stack of boxes. Okay, and it, whoa, six boxes, six boxes, six boxes, whoa. Can he go as high as 12? Let us find out if I can go as high. Apparently not. Can he go as high as 11? Can he go as high as 11 boxes? Let's find out. Oh, careful. 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 And... Ha-ha! A single stack of boxes! Huh. Okay, well, like I said, you can't stack a single stack of things too high, because it will, it will fall. Ha-ha! Science! 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 This is a pencil. You probably have one of these at home and use it for all kinds of interesting things like writing and drawing, and that may be it. But if you have a lot of pencils, you can build stuff. I'll show you some of my favorite pencil builds. Check this out. It's a pencil cube. If you want to try building one yourself, you build it like this. Get a piece of foam and then lay out 11 pencils this way, and then another 11 that way, so they make a nice square. Then take sharpened pencils and stick them into the foam in all the gaps. Go all the way around and then keep adding more layers of pencils and eventually you will have a cube. Now, if you don't have 366 pencils at home, you can do the same thing with toothpicks. Now, if you want to research this on your own to find the instructions, just try looking up pencil cube. Okay, that's not the only thing we can build with pencils. Check this out, a pencil asterisk. Phil, can you max it out and add some more pencils? Yeah, so I did. I maxed it out with even more pencils. And then I thought, well, could I max it out again? So I did. This is what it looks like with even more pencils. And in fact, I removed the inside pencils and the whole thing still stays together. And then of course, this is the maximum number of pencils you can do with this configuration because as you can see, it starts to become a sphere and you kind of run out of pencil length. There you go, maxed out pencil structures. Of course, I've used all of my pencils, but that's okay, I will buy some more. I will just write myself a note to buy more. Actually, there are sharpened pencils on the bottom of my pencil cube, so I'll just, I'll just, I'll just write this note with the pencil cube. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, ready? One, two, three. And it's still standing! Oh, that one's not sharpened. Oh, here we go. Where'd my book go? Silita and I got our maxed out spinning top to work pretty well. The only thing left to do was to ride it. We attached a large disc and a Lazy Susan. That's a platform that spins around on ball bearings. Lazy Susan on top. Lazy Susan. So that you can ride on it. Yes, and then we wanted to add this extra bit. Now, why did we want to add this? We need a little bit more um, weight on our top. Okay, so who gets to ride it? Um, I feel like you should ride it. I think you might be because right. Because I want to use oh, the drill. The super awesome maxed out drill. Okay, so let's do it. First thing I should say is do not, do not try this at home. We are trained scientists. Silita uses the drill to get it spinning while I hold it steady. Then I hold on to our safety line above and carefully rest my weight on the top. It works, but not for long. 
We take turns trying it out, but it seems we have another part of science working against us. Good old friction. Friction with the air and with the ground is what eventually slows the spinning top down. But our weight on the ball bearings of the Lazy Susan really increases the friction. More friction means the top slows down a lot faster. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that was pretty cool. It was kind of terrifying, right? Yeah. Good old Newton's first law kept the top spinning, angular momentum kept it from falling over, and friction slowed it back down. The forces were always the same, no matter if it was a little top, a maxed out top, or a rideable one. There you go, Science Max! Experiments a large, giant spinning top. That's a spinning, that's as large a spinning top as I think you I think in the entire world. Let's do it again! Yeah! <laughs> you may have heard of cup stacking, and if not, you're missing out, because not only is it fun, but it's something that kids are the world record holders at. And it's all about, you guessed it, stacking cups. Now, I have learned the pattern, but I'm not super fast at it. The world record is actually four seconds, and this is what that looks like. <laughs> but you can't use camera tricks to help you. You have to practice to get faster. Now, you don't need to use official sports stacking cups, but if you don't know your science, some things will work against you. First of all, these cups have holes in the bottom, which makes them not very good as, you know, cups. Why do they have holes in the bottom? Because of science. You see, when you pull the cups apart, there is air that needs to get inside this cup. If you don't have a hole, like these ones, the air makes them stick together because there's nowhere for the air to get in except for underneath, and they will stick. Once again, let's compare. Also, you want the cups to have some weight because if they have some weight, they'll fall out of each other easily. If they don't have any weight, like, say, these styrofoam cups, it becomes very difficult. And... <sighs> Cup stacking with trash cans! Okay, here we go. Even though these trash cans were heavy, they didn't have holes in the bottom, which means they stuck together. A lot. So why didn't I drill holes in the bottom of these trash cans? Okay, and then... Well, I needed them in episode six to make 11 barrels of slime. Okay. Two. But I eventually did it. And time. Okay, there you go. The world record in trash can stacking. I know it's, it doesn't seem very fast, but first of all, that was hard. And second of all, I am the only one to do it. So therefore, I hold the record. <sighs> this is a house of cards. And if you've never built a house of cards, you should definitely try. Try, because it's not easy. What you need to do is you need to make triangles with the cards. If you do it just right, ha ha, they'll stay up. Then you take another pair of cards, like that, and you take another card and you put it on top. Ah, and it stays up. Keep on building by making triangles and putting another card across the top like a roof. Then, when you're ready, you can start to make a second layer. It takes a lot of patience to make a house of cards. But with enough patience and really steady hands, you might be able to finish it. There we go. Ha ha, a house of cards.